Blessed are you, Lord God. Blessed are you forever. Holy is your name. Blessed are you forever. Great is your mercy for your people. Blessed are you forever. Amen. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords.
Romans chapter 8, verses 27 through 36. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> the other day I was going out to get something for Joe and I to eat and on carry out. <clears throat> and uh, I noticed how routine it was for me to put a mask on. And uh, while I feel it, I can feel it now. When I got out of the car, I thought, what kind of, or maybe I should say this better, to what can I compare this? And I thought about policemen or soldiers should go out every day, and before they go out, they put on a bulletproof vest. They know they're wearing them. Many of them will go through their lives and never have to test it out to see if it protects them. Why do they do it? They do it to protect themselves from the evil that can attack them. And they do it to protect themselves so they can help us when evil attacks us. I said, okay. From now on, this is going to be my bulletproof vest. I'll wear it to protect you so I can not, in, not in, inflict you or hurt someone else. Makes it a little easier, it makes it for a cause, certainly not as noble perhaps as the police officers that were. And by the way, when they first came out, they were bulky and they hated them. Kevlar came along and made it better. Now they wear them without even thinking about it. We won't have to wear these all the time. But while I do it, I wear it as protection for me and for others around me. And I hope that it will never, I'll never have to take a blow or take a shot or cause someone else to take a shot either. <clears throat> do you know why The Andy Griffith Show is one of the most watched reruns on television? <clears throat> because we want, and nearly, there's always stress of some kind, but we want to have some place where we can go where things are better, simpler, honest. A place like Mayberry where things all work out better. Some place where you and I, in the midst of our problems, can get away to a more simpler place and kind of enjoy the simpler pleasures of life. You've just heard <coughs> Debbie read perhaps one of the most powerful and comforting and familiar passages in the New Testament. I want to talk about it today and talk about it a little bit more than what she read. And you may have noticed if you've gone to church any length of time that preachers find passages and they often paste them on difficult and troubling situations in order to explain situations that very often are not really easily or even explainable. 
In other words, we'll take a passage and make it fit all situations. And we find in life, though, in reality, if we think about it, that one size doesn't fit all, all the time. It may fit my life at that time, but it may not fit yours at all. After last Sunday's sermon, I was walking out of the building, and Joanne Elder was walking out with me, and she kind of chuckled and said, Keith, I think I'm about, you may let me recall, a preacher talked about that in this pandemic, we can have a feeling of the a glorious new body when this old tent of ours, as he quoted, wears out, and how wonderful that will be. And Joanne kind of chuckled and said, I think I'm about ready for that new body. And I said, Joanne, it all depends on where you stand. I said, the day you were holding uh, David in your arms when he was born, did you think, oh, I want to leave this world and go to my, and get rid of this old body and find a new tent? She said, absolutely not. That wouldn't appear to you when you're holding your child in your arm. I can tell you as many pains and aches as I have, I'm going to drag this old body along as long as I can. It's the one God gave me on the world that God gave me. And I've stood beside the beds of people who beg to die and who don't always die when they want to. And I'm a person who, in some cases, uh, and we see it all the time, when a, uh, you know, when a person is critically ill, the morphine increases just a little bit. We don't euthanize, but we make it easier uh, to die at some time because that's comforting and that's what the person wants. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, sometimes it doesn't work all the way. Now, my point is here that uh, Paul uses uh, the perhaps editorial we at times, uh, but we have to remember it all depends on where you are and what situation you're in. Uh, uh, when we hear these passages quoted, or when we face these kind of situations, uh, or if you heard, I, don't, I wonder how many of you went out last week after hearing these sermons and said, oh, I want to die and go to heaven. Well, we have the assurance that when we die, we can go to heaven, but I didn't leave this building was at 81 years old, thinking I want to die and go to heaven. I want to stick around. I love the world that God gave me. I love the people that God puts around me. And I'll go with my... When they say my time goes, I don't mean that there's a clock somewhere ticking out my time. My time will run out. I'm a, I think one of the most striking things that I remember, and I think I told this before, but years ago a teenager from Knoxville, Tennessee was skiing in West Virginia and he fell. Expert skier, but for some reason he began to spit up bile and they airlifted him to Roanoke Memorial. He was in critical condition. And the folks from Knoxville came up and it just so happened that one of the people that came was an elder that I had known in West Virginia. Uh, and uh, uh, Holly had met he and his sister at Winterfest, and she was there. He was a Boy Scout, Lewis Sturm went down, and Lewis and I had stuff with the family, and everything went well, and suddenly he died. They found out later that uh, he had a kind of a condition that they couldn't diagnose, but it kind of weakened his heart. Uh, and uh, his heart couldn't stand the trauma of the surgery, even though it went well. Uh, they went home, uh, he was cremated, and then Lewis and Diane and Joe and Diane Holly took his cremates to Knoxville. The fellow who did his service had been the youth minister there. And they, he was so well known in the area that they had to use one of the biggest Baptist churches in, uh, outside of Knoxville for the service. And this young man who loved this boy dearly in his sermon said, my only regret is that he got to heaven before I did. I understand things like that, but did he really mean that? He had a wife and young children back home in Oklahoma. If they heard him say that, would they have said, Dad doesn't want to stay here anymore? Or did they realize that we preachers are prone to say things, and preachers' kids are well known to understand this? We say things we don't necessarily mean. Uh, we exaggerate some things at times when we uh, say them. Uh, when my brother Doc died, he was the brother closest to me in age. His widow, surely was a sweetheart, she said at his death, I have no regrets. And I thought that was really great. And she said something then that she again said later on, she said, everything happens for a reason. Of course it does. If I step out in front of a car not paying attention, I die because I stepped out in front of a car. That's the reason. If an airplane crashes because a mechanic leaves a tool in the engine, 
The reason the airplane crashed is because they began to collect the tool, and everything happens for a reason. But for her, it was kind of a theological position. Uh, for her, it was comforting, and I wouldn't take it away from her or you if that comforts you. For her, it was kind of an idea that, uh, if I dare say, uh, it explained the unexplained. It gave her comfort for what she couldn't understand. Uh, it explained to her, maybe if I dare use the word, her predestined life. Uh, and as I said, I wouldn't take that away from her at all. It gave her a place to stand. But when we face the kind of uncertainty that we face in many points in history, but especially now, uh, we want some kind of answers. We want an explanation. Uh, we want a sense of control, even though we say we don't want to control it. We want a sense of control by coming up with something that we can grasp and hang on to. Uh, to convince us that the world isn't completely spiraling out of control. Nearly every great novel uh, has in it the meaning of life uh, and uh, the suffering of life and the conquering of life. Uh, from the uh, Odyssey to the more contemporary, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? All of these stories have trouble, problems, and then the ending and the meaning of life. That's why you hear people say, well, everything happens for a reason, of course. Or some of them will say, well, God is just testing you. Or it's happening to make you stronger. Or uh, this is nothing compared to what heaven will be like when you get there. Or if you could see God's plan, you would know that this is all in the plan of God. Or even from this morning, and I want to assure you that I'm going to shoot this passage down. We know that all things work together for good, that those who love God are according to his purpose. I would put that in context, and again, this is a comforting passage to me, as I know it is to many of you. But you and I, I think, have realized in our life that the way people deal with pain and suffering is often very bad theology. Uh, and let me say again, if bad theology gets you through a bad situation, I won't take that away from you unless you insist that your bad theology has to be mine. But then I have to agree with you. I never met Dell's mother, and I wish I had. I hope I, I probably never will. But I love someone who will say, I don't want to die on some foreign field someday. You know, the way the song says. That's honesty. You know, are we supposed to go into, oh, yeah. She said, I don't want to do that. Bless her heart, because she's honest. And we need to be honest when someone tries to paste something on us that doesn't fit in our particular feeling of, about life. And these scriptures, the ones we use, or maybe the interpretation of them, it's a way of having an answer. It's a way of having some sense of control over the things that are overwhelming to us. And again, I'm not belittling, belittling them for your sake. If they comfort you, fine. Don't make them have to comfort me if I'm not where you are at that time. That's the, that's, and sometimes we do that. Uh, they are, these places to stand, as fragile and untheological as they are, is part of mental health to some extent. They're not that bad. And we all have a story. We all have a narrative that we stand in the middle of chaos and in the middle of life. In ancient times, the most feared thing was Enemy, not enemy, enemy, that means no law. And very often, as you know, throughout history, when people appear to be lawless, then they give in to tyranny and despotism. And we can see this throughout history. If you want to gain control over people, convince them the world is spiraling out of control, and you're the only one that can control it and can bring it back, and you alone can establish order. You may remember this was a cry. No, it goes way clear back to Maybe the Boston Tea Party. Uh, there were some people who objected to that, by the way, which were values. But in my time, it goes back to the Civil Rights Movement. These people were called rebels. They were called out of order. They were breaking the law. And the Jim Crow laws, indeed, they were breaking. It is a cry against any protest movement. And I'm not talking about rioting. I'm talking about any protest peaceful movement. The people are worried that that movement will change life as they know it, change the security that they believe they have to have, and they will fear that it is going to be 
and that lifeless thing that looked is going to be rooted and uh, up and torn from their hands. That's why we didn't let black people vote. That's why we didn't let women vote for a long time. They were too fragile. They were too emotional. You can go back and read all of this in the suffrage moments. It's the fear that these folks, more recently it's been Hispanics as well, it's the fear that these folks, if they gain power, will change things. The way to, we, we don't want them to be changed. And by the way, there are people who want to change things in a bad way. I don't think that I'm leaving that everybody wants to change things going in the right direction. I'm saying that historically, we fear the people who protest what we believe in, and they usually protest something that needs to be, like a civil rights movement change, needs to be dealt with. Um, Anyone who reads the life of Jesus knows that he was killed as an insurrectionist. He was killed as an enemy of the government. Uh, they sold that to the Romans, and the Romans bought it, and they killed him. Um, and this was still in the air. You know, as I said, the cross and the, the uh, ugliness and the, the embarrassment of the cross was still in the air when the early Christians went out of the world. And when Paul enters the picture, it's still very much in the air. And the letter to the Roman believers raises that issue. As you know, Rome was known worldwide for Pax Roma, the peace of Rome. They were the law and order government of the world. If you also know and read Roman history, you'll know that Cleopatra and Mark Antony and and Nero and some of the other uh, rulers interpreted the law differently for themselves than they did for the masses. But generally, if you went against the law of Rome, it came down hard on you. But they also were tyrants, and they also appealed to their loyalists and not to the little person. And that's the whole story of Rome and, uh, and pretty much of, of the history of domination uh, by people. Now, this letter was written to a young and vulnerable church at Rome. Um, they uh, were well aware of how quickly uh, they could be seen as a threat to law and order. And Paul wants to caution them to do the best they can not to be seen that way. Uh, they knew that they could very easily become a scapegoat for anything that went wrong in the country. And under Nero, we saw that happening, and they saw that happening. And they were seen as the enemy, and they were, and they were nearly at the attempt to annihilate them under Nero. So Paul, reflecting on them in Rome and the conditions of the world, as it was that day, says, what are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And if you were there on our own reading this letter, you'd say, Paul, I can tell you, I, we well know who is against us. But Paul says, uh, if God, who gave up his son, uh, can deal with the domination of Rome and the domination of the world and the system of law and order rule the way Romans, the Romans do it, if God is on your side, if that God is on your side, well, what then? Who will bring charge against God's elect? We are God's elect, you see. Who can charge us if we are on the side of God, Paul says in that text? Well, they knew. They knew who was against them. But Paul says, you're the elect of God. You are the elect of God. And you are larger than any Caesar. You are, God's story in you is larger than any story of any ruler or despot. Because God's story is about peace and love and the welcoming of neighbor. It's a story about how the God, how the world will look when God's kingdom is realized. Remember, Jesus said he wanted it to happen on earth as it was in heaven. I think sometimes... As I look back over my life, we converted people to save them from hell. We didn't always convert them to save the world. Well, we save the world by saving them from hell. No, no, by making the world God's world, where it reflects the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, who is to condemn? Who is to condemn? 
And of course, the only one who can condemn is Jesus Christ. And he is the one who stood on the side of the powerless when Caesars, from one Caesar, from one Pharaoh to another, has tried to suppress and step on for their own benefit and squash these people and use them for fodder. He is the one who condemns them. Jesus condemns them. Paul is reassuring, I think, and believe his readers that regardless of how it looks, God is there in the middle of it all. As bad as things are, God is there because you are the elect of God. And though Caesar appears to be all-powerful, for Paul, he's only a small part of the great drama of God. Even at our weakest, even at their weakest, God's people, bound up in the purposes of God and goals, are more powerful than the Caesars. That's what he's saying here. In other words, nothing can come between Jesus and his people. Nothing can come between the elect of God and his people. And so in one of the verses that we did not read, verse 35, Paul asked, who will separate us then from the love of Christ? The world is spinning out of control, even in Rome, when Paul writes it. But hello, Paul says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? The world is spinning out of control. Paul wants them to know, Paul wants us to know that we're part of a different story. The world spinning out of control is not my story, not your story. We are the one who has a Lord who is greater than all the Caesars and the rulers of the world. So this is the kind of question that maybe we should ask in these times, or in any time. And I ask you, is there anything that could snatch you out of the hands of Jesus Christ? Is there anything that can defeat you from bringing about the will of God on earth? Paul says, no, we're more than conquerors. He lists some things. He says distress, hardship, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Are any of these things more powerful than God? Has any, any of these things more powerful than what God revealed in Jesus Christ? Uh, can any of these things prevent, let me say it again, can any of these things, and they never have, can any of these things prevent the work of God from being realized on the earth? Paul says, no. Listen to this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. That phrase is an interesting one. It comes from a kind of Greek philosophy, and Paul, as you know, is very well as a Greek philosopher, and quotes them quite often, but it came from a Stoic uh, view of philosophy. According to the theologian Michael Mormon, Paul is drawing a contrast between Israel and some of the Stoic ideas of the world. Suffering, according to some thinking, and many Christians would say suffering, and they think, usually, we think of, let me say this here, I'll probably say it again somewhere, because the list that Paul gives does not say pain, does not say sickness. That list that he says what will separate us are all the things that happen when you are oppressed or enslaved people who are trying to be dominated. You're without food, you're, you're naked, you're in prison, you're uh, distressed. All of these things have to do not with having cancer, it has to do with where you stand in a world where Caesar is trying to control you. Well, the world, as we say, is trying to control you. And the <coughs> Stoicism said that you endure suffering. It's good for you. You endure it. Paul doesn't say that. Paul says we are more than conquerors. We don't ignore it. And remember, we're not talking about illness or cancer or something like that. You deal with that in your own way. But Paul is talking about the suffering that you suffer because you're trying to bring about the will of God in the world and how you're going to do it. We don't act as though it has no effect upon us because it does. We see God present in the midst of everything that happens to us. All things work together. Not just holding our hands as, and, and, and loving us, as important as that is for us to feel, 
But working in the world to bring about a place where Caesar does not win. As I said, remember that when you read the list, he's talking about things that oppressed people deal with. Not cancer or something like that. This is about conquering the powers that stand between God and his kingdom and his people and the world. Sometimes we say, well, you know, God allows or permits. God has never allowed or permitted evil. God confronts and opposes evil. Evil exists, as I said, it almost has to, of course, to know, to, to know what good is. God opposes evil. God hates evil. God doesn't want it to happen. And God conquers evil. How? How does God conquer evil? With good. With love, compassion, long suffering. You see, the gospel has never asked us to take over the thrones of the world. The gospel has asked us to change the hearts of people. Jesus said, King of God is like leaven, quietly works, brings about the change. Hardly even noticed that then suddenly it's apparent. If you and I look at history, especially the history of Israel, we see the downfall of God's people every time they tried to mimic the power of the world. Every time they tried to mimic the powers around them, they fall. Saul did it, David did it, Solomon did it. The hand has not been told of your glory, said the Queen of Sheba. The divided kingdoms did it. They all sought to establish themselves by using the power of the Caesar, the power of the world, the kingdoms of the world around them. And every so-called Christian ruler has fallen the same way and done the same. We are not just to endure. Uh, we are to be more than endurers. We are to be, as Paul said, you are more than a conqueror. And we do that. We do that. When the gospel we preach changes hearts. When the gospel we preach changes hearts. We ask people to repent. And we think, well, oh, there's a sin I committed back then. No, no, you change your way of looking at the world. You will not look at the world the way the world looks at it anymore. You will not look at people the way the world looks at them anymore. You will not think about people the way the world thinks about them anymore. You will change your life. And the gospel must change your life. You're not just changing doctrine. You're having a change of heart. It does not seek domestic power. But it seeks the power of love and self-sacrifice. The kind of love, if you and I even look at it and read it, that we see in the life of Jesus Christ. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, well-known theologian in Germany, he, and I've said this before, actually, and I'm wrapping this up. He said this, he was part of the plot to kill Hitler. He just had enough, he didn't think. Uh, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed one day before the Allies liberated uh, the city of Berlin. And I don't think that Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to believe that that was working together for his good. You think about one more day. I don't, he may have gone to his death nobly, but I don't think he necessarily thought this is for my good. Any more than a Jew heading to the gas chamber would have to believe that it was for his good. It depends on where you stand. It depends on how you feel. But we have this confidence and conviction that nothing, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And nothing, nothing, nothing will keep us from being more than conquerors when we oppose that which God opposes. Amen. Thank you for coming. Let's stand. Let's stand. spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There Liberty and
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. From whom all blessings flow Praise Him, all creatures here below Praise Him above the heavenly host Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Many more. <laughs>